Well, thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, Bob, who spent probably days preparing prepared remarks, was startled when I stopped and said, oh, let's not do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were having a conversation last night, and some of you may have noticed that not only do we share the same first name, we, we share the same race. <laughs> Yet, black gospel music has been both of our compulsion, compassion, for a very, very long time. And Bob was telling us he was speaking at a, an event, a book festival in Mississippi or somewhere, and a lady stood up and said, didn't it, can't we, couldn't we find a black person to do this? And Bob and I, of course, were the first to say, yeah, we should. That should be the focus. But I think one of the things we wanted to talk about was that we are coming into a field, and clearly we're prejudiced, that we believe this is the foundational music of all American popular music, maybe the single most distinctive American music form that has impacted the world like nothing else. Every other music form you like came from this root, the spirituals, gospel, freedom song. And yet, when we both started writing our first books on gospel music, we could count the number of books on gospel music on one hand and have fingers left over. And what we have continued to write about and love and support in our different ways, Bob being one of the major two or three collectors in the world of the music, and my work with the libraries here, I think what most excites us is that it now means that right behind us, because of things like the Pruitt Symposiums, there is for the first time a whole wave of extraordinary young African-American scholars who have found this music and found their roots and their life and have decided to dedicate their academic careers to it. And providing, as the library and Bob's own work have done, a, a a foundation, a bank, a library of, of, for them to draw upon maybe is something he and I are as proud of as anything that's been accomplished that's right. to make sure this endures. That's right. And, yeah, exactly, Bob. That uh, When I first decided to teach, and this is, you know, why gospel music matters is for so long, as Dr. Maxiel pointed out, it didn't matter to a lot of people. And when I first started my research, when I decided I... I knew enough to be dangerous, and I really needed to teach myself more about the, the records, a few records I had, and this was in the early 90s. I could only find about three books in the library. Uh, Viv Broughton's book, Tony Heilbert's book, and uh, there was an Oxford guide, I think, to blues, jazz, and gospel. And that was it. Uh, I couldn't find anything on a lot of the artists' records I had. There was nothing on Roberta Martin or... Uh, I, I think one of the first gospel records I ever bought uh, was at my late wife's insistence was Mahalia Jackson. And I only remembered her because of the commercials on television to sell her, you know, 30 greatest songs, you know, after she passed. So it was discouraging to me to say, I really want to learn about this music, but there's no resource. Um, and so that's, that's one of the reasons why it matters, because this music is the foundation. Um, I think... I see gospel music as important in three different ways. You know, certainly we talk about the musical aspect of it, which is how it has influenced so many different types of music, including classical, you know, going back even to the spirituals with Dvorak. Uh, so you, know, you, you don't hear a singer these days on the pop scene who somehow or another isn't channeling a Clara Ward or a Roberta Martin or a, you know, a Marian Anderson. I mean, if you trace the... If you trace it, you have Mary, Mary and Williams of the Stars of Faith with her high hooping to Little Richard and the development of rock and roll from there. That's a direct descendant of gospel music. The second part is the, the social. And this is the part I think is, is what uh, drives both of us in particular is the voices and the expressions are here. Uh, not necessarily explicit. But if you read or listen between the lines, you hear the stories and you know what's being said. Uh, it's a little bit like the spirituals. There is an undercurrent. Um, and this is an expression of a people at a specific time that were it not for these recordings and were it not for them being saved, 
we might lose. Uh, and perhaps the most important is the spiritual or religious part. Um, this was something that uh, really struck me when I was writing my book on Peace Be Still, uh, talking to the members of the Angelic Choir of the First Baptist Church in Nutley, New Jersey, who made the great Peace Be Still album that's here in the archive. Um, and I, coming in there, automatically assumed, well, this song was recorded four days after the Birmingham bombing of 16th Street Baptist Church. Surely this incident had some impact on the recording. And the choir members looked at me and they said, no, not really. What it told me was this, this was their life. They had grown so, certainly they were shocked and devastated by what happened. There was no question about it. But this was life. And the idea was we were not going to let anyone stop us from praising the Lord. We were here to praise the Lord and we were going to do it no matter what. And I thought that is the message of gospel music, resilience, and the idea that there is a God that can, that protects you and holds on to you. And so that whole piece, that whole religious spiritual piece, whether it's the interior, the internal feeling of being protected or the external part of saying, listen, if Jesus could stop the winds and the waves, wouldn't we want to get some more souls in, involved in the church with that? All of that is why this music matters. I don't know of any other kind of music that offers that kind of uh, enrichment and rich history and, and feeling and, and the, the human experience. And my particular area has been direct, recent research has been directly because of what we found here. As the vinyl started coming in and uh, we did an interview on Fresh Air with Terry Gross, and of course that set off a, a widespread where boxes and boxes started coming. Bob probably knew this, but for the rest of the scholars in the field, we didn't know this. That hundreds, maybe, of the vinyl 45s, I see some young people here, should we have a prop or show them what they're doing? What a funny, what they're doing, what they're doing. See, there used to be these black round, uh, I don't think we can do that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, there's there one of those. An A side and a B side. The A side would be the hit side. And then the B side would often be a throwaway. But what we very early discovered as we started getting this many pieces of vinyl, that a, a disproportionate number of the B sides were civil rights related. And this was news to everybody who had been studying this. We knew some, but we didn't know literally hundreds would have songs, not just the freedom songs, but songs with very overt messages like, I believe Dr. Martin Luther King is in heaven, or there ain't no segregation in heaven. And as I started thumbing through these well-loved and well-played 45s, began to see the idea of a young black man or black woman walking through Birmingham in 1963, and on one side, a Dorothy Love Coates song, which probably 99.9% .9 of white people had never heard, but was a hit in the black church. But on the B side, this very subversive song talking about different movement sites that were happening right then around the country, using it to spread the word. And it made me think of the spirituals that now we know, and Dr. Henry Louis Gates is one of those who first articulated this, this double voice in this. There is a message for the white slave owners, but for the enslaved people, there was another message entirely. And one that if you were part of this group, you drew all kinds of things from. You drew encouragement. It helped you when you were down. It helped you get information where you needed to go. It helped. It, there were teaching songs. There were all kinds of things going on. But the ones related to the civil rights movement were a direct line, it seemed to me, to these spirituals. And as a result, spent the next nine years tracking down the people who sang those songs and ask, why did you sing this one? Where did you sing it? What were you hoping to accomplish when you sang, you know, ain't gonna turn, nobody gonna turn me around on the streets of Selma or Chicago, whatever. And that ended up with the next two books that I did on it, Nothing But Love and God's Water. And from there, other scholars have followed off on different trails from that. That never would have happened had we not been able to start pulling enough vinyl together to see that this wasn't an anomaly, but that it was a serious movement going on within the movement. 
And that is another one of the values of having physical collections. A collection where, yes, yes, digital is incredibly wonderful. One of these days I'll figure out Daryl and Steve's Qualtrics, the new system that they have for things. <laughs> giving me fits right now, but no. <laughs> but to see it and to compare it and to physically hold them and to put them side by side and know that these pieces of vinyl were literally held by the heroes of the movement. So many of the stuff came from Birmingham and my collection. So this was held by those people who stood there in front of those water cannons, who suffered the dog bites, who were beaten by Jim Clark. And this is a record they never get to say otherwise. And Bob and I both have been incredibly moved by individual pieces of vinyl and the music that we have heard and the one that, if you've heard me before, for sure, and probably Bob, uh, The Old Ship of Zion by the Mighty Wonders of Aquasco, Maryland. Uh, now 15, 14 years since you sent me that first piece, and Tony Tady, our original engineer, calling us into the only halfway finished studio in here and saying, I think you need to hear this out of the hundreds we had received and breaking down into tears in that room with those gorgeous speakers, hearing that song for the first time and realizing once again there is this apostolic succession that continues that you and I have been privileged to be a part of trying to ensure. And that's a great, uh, you mentioned Old Ship of Zion. I mean that, you know, talking about the importance of preserving gospel music and in a lot of respects because it hasn't gotten the, uh, the respect it deserves from the public um, now, the gentleman who gave me Old, old Ship of Zion, he didn't mean it, but he, he was a collector. He didn't want this music. He, didn't, he said, you know what, I know you play this on the, you've got a righteous collection, you take it. I'll give him, you know, so there were 70 or 80 or 90 records in there, and that was one of them. Um, it was that invaluable to a collector. Um, uh, there was, uh, and, that, and that's why I think we're at a, a crossroads, because that still happens today. Um, I'm not going to call names, but the Charles Fold Singers, uh, and some of you in the audience will know the Charles Fold Singers, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. They're celebrating their 50th anniversary in Cincinnati this weekend. I could not get one outlet to cover it. Not one. And they were, at, at the end of the 70s with James Cleveland, the most, I guess the biggest hit gospel artist according to Billboard magazine. James Cleveland and the Charles Fold Singers were the biggest hits, and yet we could not, people would say, who's the Charles Fold Singers? And you're like, you're in Cincinnati. They're the greatest gospel group that ever came out of Cincinnati. How do you not know who the Charles Fold Singers are? Um, and, and yet, you, that, that's the case. When I, uh, the first uh, person that contacted me about an article about Peace Be Still said, Wow, we never heard of Peace Be Still. Who's James Cleveland? And, you know, I, I sort of, but I realize that's, that's, that's the case. Now James is a little bit better known because he's been seen in the Aretha movie as being Aretha's uh, music teacher. By the way, Aretha liked him because she had a piano teacher who scared the death out of her. She said she was so mean and stern, she'd come in the house and Aretha would hide. So they thought James Cleveland would be a better music teacher for her than that one. But... Um, but so this, this, this still happens where there's this sense, uh, Tony Heil, but had the same thing happen on NPR. Somebody said he was talking about Marion Williams, the great soprano uh, MacArthur fellow. And the person said, well, yeah, she's you know, really not known by many people. And he said, unknown to whom? He said, if you ask the African-American church community, they absolutely know who Marion Williams is. So there's still this education to go on. But, and I say we're at a crossroads because gospel is starting to get hip again with certain groups of young people who are finding it on YouTube and listening to it and liking it. Uh, maybe not necessarily liking it for all the reasons that we may think it's important to like, but they like it. And now they're going on online auctions, and it's not unusual to see a record that we could have picked up for a couple of bucks go for 150 or two or $300. There was one that went for $200, one of Luther Barnes' records. I, I told Luther Barnes' uh, production guy, said, tell Luther if he's got any records in his closet, Christmas money. He's got some Christmas money there. We're just waiting for him. But that's the, so there is this, this new wave of interest in gospel music. 
perfect timing for the archive because as this new generation comes in and listens, together we'll be able to help educate other generations about what this music is all about. And in my opening remarks earlier, I talked about the library and how coming here when Mr. Royce had called and see Bill Hare and Daryl and Tim Logan. I don't know how much any of them knew about gospel music. Being librarians, they were better, better read than most people, but I don't know how much in detail any of them said. But they all said yes, and from that moment on spent their own time, on their own hours, putting this together on top of their own very extensive jobs. The flip side of what Bob just said is, We've been very blessed here at the Black Gospel Project that we've had people like Bob Maravich and others who have either loaned us or donated a great deal of what we have. There will come a time when that will be, we will run out of potential suppliers, frankly, because there's not that many big collectors out there. We're dealing with one right now who may be the second biggest, Opal Lewis Nations. But as we see gaps in our collection, which are essentially gaps in America's collection, since we have the main body of it here, and we're going to be talking, and Daryl and I have talked about this, maybe we need to set up a fund to do some buying of individual things to complete collections. The stuff we used to see for $7.98 is now would blow our entire budget on a single buy. And that's good that there's an interest, but there is an interest and there is collection. And one of the things that, one of the reasons why so little gospel music is available and when I did People Get Ready, our figure we came up, and I had actually checked with Bob on, was 75% of all gospel music from the Golden Age was unavailable. Whether it was through greed or racism or in landfills, you could not get it. Now, that figure is better now because of this place. But it is not a trend. You want, I struggle with this a little bit, Bob, because I want people to hear it. I want people to love it, but buying it for collections and then salting it away in your garage because to say, I have it now, I've got the complete set of Greenwood <laughs> LPs here, which is wonderful, except for nobody ever hears it. And so for the first few years of the project with uh, Daryl and Tim and the others trying to figure out a way how we could make this for people to hear without violating copyright issues. So for so long until the streaming situation came, we had to put it up on iTunes and let people, right, download it. Am I saying this right, Daryl? There. And there's copyright issues with that. But one day that changed, thanks to Billy and Congress and a few other people on that. But it doesn't matter, Bob, if you can't hear it. Just saving it is only half the battle. And why Bob's been such an extraordinary friend to this project, sending for 10 years now, easily, easily 10 years, 50 45s to us every month, which we digitize and then send back, and he sends another 50. For 10 years now, this has been going on, and we're just now coming to the end of his 45 collection, as he mentioned. <laughs> we're about to go to vinyls in 78. But what an extraordinary sharing gift. Bob never wanted it to remain in an attic or somewhere. That's why you're at every coming home ceremony and every concert on the <laughs> south side to this day. And as you see photos of these elaborate funerals and stuff, there's one sad little white face right. in the middle, and it's you. And that's why they open their homes and their churches to you, because they know you care that much. Well, and that's, that's what I, and you're absolutely right, Bob. And that, that was what prompted me to do my radio show, Gospel Memories, in 2001. I didn't have that many records at the time, but I just thought, they're doing me no good sitting in the closet. I can only listen to one at a time. Uh, and, uh, and with the busyness of day and your work and all that, you can hardly listen to them at all. So to have some opportunity to have people listen to them and enjoy them, and so this is an extension of that, was to say, you know, can others enjoy this music and when it's, you know, it should be, have some utility outside of my closet. Uh, and, and, uh, and again, I, I was saying to Daryl uh, at lunch, I mean, we haven't even hit the 78s yet. And that's really, I think, a lot of the real gold is because that is uh, early, early, early. Those are acetates. And if we talk about 70% of gospel records being extinct, the acetates, the one-offs were a church choir 
did something once on our acetate, those are even harder to find at all. In fact, um, I just last year, during the pandemic, found, uh, and this is a geeky moment for me, I suppose, here. <laughs> It was, it, I've never really heard Thomas A. Dorsey direct the Pilgrim Baptist Church Choir. His, he's famous, that's his famous gospel choir. And he, and, but yet there was never any commercial recordings that they made. Well, somebody made a recording of the Pilgrim Baptist Church with Thomas A. Dorsey directing and on accordion uh, from about 1946. Um, and I'm a big fan of trying to find the earliest recordings of a gospel chorus in Chicago. And 1946 is about where we're at. Uh, if it weren't for finding this acetate out in Elgin, Illinois, or somewhere like that, and had it not, and it did actually get lost in the mail, was sent to Pennsylvania and found its way back for a while, we were nervous, um, we would not have it at all. There's a, a number of acetates that this, as a pastor on the south side of Chicago, who everybody remembers, but they never made any records. It was not a big deal to make records. Uh, so that's the only voice we probably have of that pastor. Uh, or that singer, or somebody like C.L. Franklin who had acetates that were never made into records, and, uh, and so those are out there. So that idea of preservation, the, the acetates are, are very, very important. Uh, but I also want to mention what you talked about. I, to me, my late wife was a better freedom fighter than I'll ever be. She worked as a, a teacher at an African-American high school on the west side, and she had a choir, and every year they would do classical and you know all the kind of choir songs that a high school would do but at the end of the concert they always finished with whatever was the big gospel song of the era with Kirk Franklin or Orlando Draper Hezekiah Walker and that sort of reinvigorated my interest in gospel music um, and uh, and so she was very much she found it was very important for black and white to get together say so, you know so much of the issues are we don't know each other and so I, I think that's sort of what I hope is going to be my legacy eventually whenever I'm called to the great upstairs uh, where there's free bubble up and rainbow stew is to, uh, is to have no, being known for bringing people together, to being the person who, I, I mean, I grew, up, I grew up in a racist area. I, I know that. Um, I want to be the one that said, no, I'm going to, to, I'm going to join our communities together. I want us to know each other. And if I can do it through the music, and, and I love my gospel community in Chicago. It is one of the most accepting, uh, un unapologetically accepting group of people. I, I mean, more than my own church would ever have been. To know that, you know, I'm, who am I? I didn't grow up in the black church. Um, I didn't have those same experiences. Um, and yet being accepted, uh, any time I've ever been questioned about my involvement in gospel music has not been from an African-American person. So um, I feel like, is this something I can do? If I can make one step and try to bring us together in this way and, and, and bond over gospel music, then, then my life shall not have been in vain. <laughs> oh, great. Don't expect me to sing about everything. <laughs> I mouth the words when we go to black churches, but I do it very energetically, but I don't actually say anything. Um, we have had some extraordinary experiences as we have followed this road, and I, I don't want to turn this into a one-up sort of thing, but Bob has been places many of us can only dream, and Mary and I have had a small part of that, but not the same to degree Bob has. Bob, you... Could you talk just for a minute, because I've always been curious, of all the extraordinary churches and services, some of which were uh, spontaneous, some of which had been planned for months and months, can you talk just a minute I, uh, about some of those days, or again, the, the, the lone, probably white guy, or at least the two of you there, and in a community that has been attacked and fought and marginalized for a century, and yet has made you a part of to the degree that you were just honored by the Black Radio Guild Association yeah. and nationwide for his work, not just for his show, but his work as an author and for preservation. <laughs> and it's only the latest of several honors. And, Bob, and before he starts, I do want to put a plug in for his new books. <laughs> he does have the new book, uh, City... Uh, Peace Be Still with uh, James Cleveland coming out next month on what is one of the three or four pivotal songs in the black tradition. 
and uh, equally fun, a new from the legendary black label of Mississippi, Malico, the first ever definitive four CD set on the Reverend James Cleveland. And as we often say, if there is a, a Mount Rushmore of gospel music, Thomas Dorsey, Mahalia, James Cleveland, and Andre Crouch will be on that <laughs> uh, there. And Bob just completed a very detailed, the first detailed. Now this is what's frustrating. As a music, musician, composer who has influenced innumerable white singers who are at the top of charts his entire life, what you wrote, this booklet that goes in the CD set, is by a factor of 10, the largest bit of research ever done on James Cleveland. Most of the people you interviewed had never been interviewed before. No, and I would have never thought that I would be the James Cleveland biographer. And I know there are others who are going to start doing more in depth, because I really wanted with the James Cleveland box set to focus on the music. How did, you know, how did J James was, uh, I always call him a, gos a gospel gadfly. He would be anywhere he could be in order to make himself seen, which is really what you need to do as a musician. If somebody needed a musician, James was, I know the songs, uh, he would get up there or if he would write a note uh, and somebody would pass it up to the front and say, somebody asked for Mr. James Cleveland to sing to the uh, congregation today and James wrote that note and walk up there. Um, <laughs> he knew how to get attention. Um, and you know, to the point where um, when he started the Gospel Music Workshop of America, he could just gather his friends around a table and know that it, he could make it. But, um, but even so, I mean, you think of all the contributions James has made over all the years, and yet there was never a book or anything like that, except for chapters, you know, here and there, on James Cleveland. So this is a first attempt to try to tell the story. What was his music like? What was his musicality? James took the old traditional church sound from Dorsey and Roberta. He loved Roberta Martin and moved it to the contemporary world without making it so contemporary because James, like all of us, we kind of have two sides. He would not want it to be too contemporary, but then he would work with Elton John. So how do you justify saying, I don't want to take this music too far out, but then I'm going to sing on very unreligious tracks on Elton John's Blue Moves? He was a great entrepreneur. This man had indefatigable energy, and the energy of ultimately uh, created his demise. And he was 59 years old when he passed away. Um, and uh, part of it was that he would relentless go, 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 and never stop. Um, but yeah, uh, with, with the, the, the church services, um, I feel, uh, I grew up Catholic, but I feel more Pentecostal, <laughs> because I've been in more Pentecostal churches than Catholic churches. Probably the two, uh, and, and because I, I really am a, a student of history, and, and, and a lot of times, and we were talking about this at lunch, artists will say, you know, thank you for remembering me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, I am like total fanboy right now talking to you. Um, it's, uh, I would say the two, the most significant prog programs I went to was the first church of deliverance in Chicago. It's a spiritual church. The spiritual religion believes the soul never dies until the end. And so there's the choir and there's the heavenly choir. And they will feel the presence. And uh, Reverend Clarence H. Cobbs, who is probably one of the most colorful and interesting characters in Chicago history, who nobody will ever write a book about, unfortunately, was the pastor of this church. It uses the same format for worship as it did in 1929. And so to go in this church, this art modern church with a big lit cross on the top and the green and the candles and the incense and you can't walk in the middle aisle and then the choir marches in and they sing all these same songs that they've been singing for decades. I, I was just in heaven to do that and just to be part of what to me was like sitting in on a, it was like sitting in on the his, a history lesson. The other one is the uh, Cosmopolitan Church of Prayer in Chicago, another spiritual church. So maybe I'm more spiritual than Pentecostal. Um, this is a romp and stomp and choir. And this church and Father Hayes, which is the first church, it was actually the first time I ever heard gospel was a broadcast of Cosmopolitan Church of Prayer. They are unapologetically traditional. I mean, there's washboards and uh, tambourines and Dr. Father Hayes loved, the pastor loved that traditional, but he took some of that Detroit swagger 
you know, the, the classical piece and all that, the, the Charles Craig sound and all this great, wonderful musicianship and blended it together under Dr. Charles Clancy. And so when you go to that service, I mean, if you're not saved, you're going to be <laughs> by the end of it, you know. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have, he wouldn't, he would say the, the, the wall, the doors of the church are open and Father Hayes would be checking to see how many people come in. Uh, he, he uh, that was also uh, a great experience. But you know, what was most interesting uh, was to be in South Africa, in Durban. I had some friends take us there and we thought we would hear African religious music at this church in Durban, South Africa. And the choir got up to sing Total Praise. <laughs> and did a great job of it. And I realized this is how far gospel music has gone around the world. So the little church, Bible church in Durban is singing Richard Smallwood. We will have our annual Pruitt Symposium. Uh, Kathy and I have been working, I'll say, Kathy's been working hard on it. I've been on her coattails on it. And we'll be doing a, a Zoom this time with three scholars from England who are all specialists on Andre Crouch, because of the influence Crouch has had from his tours over there. We could have just as easily done it on scholars in Sweden, where Crouch is still number one, and whose influence has changed both churches and music there to a great degree. What gospel music has done, and why this matters, and why what we're hoping matter, but primarily why we're so proud to be a part of this is. There is this apostolic tradition. There is this message that has continued through the time of the enslaved people, through the time of the civil rights movement. And as Bob and I have talked to each other, as we watch the earliest funerals from the uh, Black Lives Matter, we would see kids way too young and their parents way too young still singing the same freedom songs, still singing the gospel songs that had nurtured and supported and saved, not just their grandparents or their great grandparents, but as far back as we could go. And yeah, there is a historical importance to what we're saving, but music that is so deep into the DNA of oppressed people. And we have both watched these songs sung during the Arab Spring. We've watched them sung during the Hong Kong Umbrella Revolution. I never have heard the tape, but BBC has one of some of the freedom songs being sung on Tiananmen Square the night before the fifth Chinese army mowed down 10,000 teenagers. These songs are people who are not Christian and not black. We have, and I, I speak for myself, but I believe Bob agrees, we have been given an extraordinary um, commission here. We have been blessed, but we've also been tasked with it. And as I walked in this morning and saw what Daryl and his team and, and all the architects and all the people who contributed to this running, I have to believe that there's a cloud of witnesses, the people who came before us that say, this is great, good job, now let's get to work because there's so much more to be done that will go on long past our time here and the legacy that the libraries and Ella Pritchard and others have helped create and Charles Royce, who has still never been here, who has still never seen any of this, who did it out of an impulse, like the Bible says, don't stand on the corner and see yourself being prayed to pray. He just wanted to give something and keep his name off it. We had, he never did answer if we kept asking if we could put his name on here. He wouldn't even say yes or no. So we just did it anyway. <laughs> That's what you do to donors. You just do what you want on you know, that kind of stuff. Right, so put her in there. Yeah, that's how we've been so successful, is that to be honored and privileged to be here and to be part of this thing which has kept this music where, as I've said before, music where all, everything extraneous is burned away as before a refiner's fire where all the dross is gone and what remains are the melodies that transform lives that anybody can sing. And what remains are the words that have changed America and are continuing to change the word, world. And we have been privileged and honored to be part of those who carry it forward. And I, I don't know that there'll be much in my life that will be more rewarding as I look back on my own dotage 
which could happen any day now, as, uh, <laughs> that I thank you all for all that everybody from the again, from those who were there in the first day, Bill and Daryl and Tim, and those who have come in later, like Dean Archer, who had a vision far beyond what I ever dreamed it could be. Yeah, that, I love that image of the, the ancestors looking down, because I think that's true. That you know, that There were a lot of sung heroes in their day, but they've been forgotten now. Uh, if, if, and, and even those who knew them it may, you know, just out of time, have forgotten them, but they're not being forgotten here. And I think why gospel music matters is that it's keeping their stories alive. Every one of these artists that are in here, pastors as well, have a story. Uh, and, and it's an, a remarkable story. And so for this to be the stepping stone for an art, uh, uh, a researcher or historian to come in and tell that story, you know, who was so-and-so? I saw this record. Who, who was this person? And to dig down deep and to learn these stories, um, that is really where this is going. You know, I, it was no hyperbole when I was working on my first book what people would say, you know, when we were coming up in the 40s, 50s, gospel music sometimes was about all we had. Um, and in, the, and in the church, you know, after six days of working in terrible jobs, being treated uh, despicably by everyone, um, but what we could look forward to a Sunday morning. And uh, as Donald Vales once expressed, it was a, just a wonderful evocation. He said, you know, the person who had to uh, clean some white person's house all week on Sunday could march, put on a robe and march up the middle of that aisle in that church, and she was a color, coloratural person coloratura uh, opera star, a gospel singer, uh, or the gentleman who was uh, cleaning floors or working in the, the, the uh, stockyards on Sunday morning could be the usher or a trustee or a deacon, and it gave people a chance to be somebody. And I think for a lot of the gospel artists who really did go on, it gave them a chance to be somebody. That was Dorsey's thing. He was forever looking for... Uh, confirmation of his existence. Uh, he found it in gospel, or gospel found him, but he forever was looking for a reason for what he did and, and to be respected and admired for who he was, and he, he got that. So all of this music, it's in the music. It's what's in the groove that counts. It's, it's in there. These stories are in there. The, the, and as I mentioned earlier today, um, this is a great repository for people who never got a chance to. I, I, people that have contacted me and said, you know, my grandfather was pastor of such and such church, but I was born after he passed, and I've never heard his voice. But I know he's on a record. He has a sermon record somewhere, and you could find it and get it to them to hear, and just the idea that they could hear their grandfather's voice for the first time in their lives, or to hear their parents again. Uh, it's been years before. Maybe some of them they were little, and they vaguely remember their grandparents in different churches, and to hear that just brings it back. So... Without this, they wouldn't have that. So it is, it's like a, it's an archive of, of, of existence of, of people being able to tap into it, learn, grow, uh, and, and remember. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, there are questions. Yes. Mr. Morovic. Yes. I hope I pronounced your name properly. You actually gave it the Serbian pronunciation, which is the right one. You know, I haven't. Um, I did send a copy of my book to First Lady Michelle, um, and I don't know if she ever received it, <laughs> but I did send it. Um, but that's a very good point. Um, finally, this is off the ground after months or years of angry. You know, it was just really a hard, hard thing, and it really didn't need to be this difficult. Um, but that's a very good point. And I think they're now in a position where they could actually probably talk about uh, what goes in the library. Uh, You 
tell people to be instrumental in building libraries and their, their friends are former donors. But yep. I think that um, they would be thrilled. Well, right. You know, All South, all South Side, yeah. Well, so, um, there'd, be, uh, there'd be some love for what we have done. Well, yeah. It, it, it already set in. Well, and I think, you know, there's a great opportunity just to uplift the history of black churches in Chicago. I mean, it's an amazing history. It's been done. Or people have written here and there. Um, but to really, I mean, I've never seen uh, an exhibit of the great African-American churches in Chicago. Um, and I think there'd be a lot of appetite for that. And well, since the South Side was the first place to really welcome the Great Migration, most of those foundational churches and gospel music in particular, but just the whole political landscape of African-American Chicago really still comes from the South Side of Chicago. So absolutely, great idea. Thank you. Uh, that's who I know. Another question? Well, th thank you, Ella. I, the first gospel concert I ever saw was at Baylor University. I had seen black people sing in church, but a true gospel artist concert. I am a freshman at Baylor, and in Waco Hall, Andre Crouch on his fall 1972, uh, 73 tour came here. And I thought I would show up and... It was packed. I had no idea. So I ended up sitting up in the balcony of Waco Hall with a couple friends. And for the first and only time in my life, uh, midway through the concert, I wish I could remember the songs or anything detailed, but midway through it, I, I was afraid that the rapture was going to come before he finished. I was so... <laughs> it was such an emotional cloud, such an emotional moment, and standing and, and crying... And I've been a, a fan ever since. And I think sometimes these books, um, like Bob said, find you rather than you find them. And I knew I wanted to do something as kind of a, a, a final project to cap a, a career spent in this music. And it was all, I always knew in the back of my mind it was going to be on Andre who is in more hymnals, black and white, than any other contemporary composer, who his songs have had more total plays, and who is one of the few people whose gospel music has been recorded by everybody from Paul Simon to Elvis Presley. And his influence is so pervasive in so many areas, and yet most of my young black students, when I talk about it, have never heard of him. So it's, it was time and to be able to still talk to the people who knew him and recorded with him now uh, over nearly 130 interviews that I've done, all mostly on Zoom, with these extraordinary people who got their start with him, helped me get through the pandemic, to be there and be blessed and talk to many of them in their 70s and 80s, and many of them who've gone on to be pastors themselves. I guess that's a thing. When you get a certain age, you want your own little church that you're in charge of and who end our Zoom with, and they're so grateful to be able to talk about this person who touched them so deeply that they always want to pray with me and for me and put their hands on the screen and ask God to bless and empower our work and that we finish. Um, and it, um, I, once again, I, I'm not smart enough to have figured this out on my own. I think this is one of those ordained things that when you get involved with it, God will make a way. Yes, and right. to quote uh, well, at least one famous spokesperson, uh, to make a way out of no way, because I had no idea it was going to end up this way. Amen. Put it in good hands, that's for sure. Any other oh, Yes. Oh, Uh, 
project have any plans to invite gospel artists to come and lecture or or perform lecture? And, yes. um, a, is there any plan for that? Kathy Hillman and I worked for 10 years doing just that through the Pruitt Symposium. And in addition to a performance component, we have both scholars and when we can, artists. And for this final one coming up in a year or so on Andre Crouch, our goal with Ella's blessing has been to invite as many of the former singers and backup singers and musicians to come and be taught, be on panels, to do workshops, as well as the scholarly component and in a perfect world. And I, I say that because it is a perfect world in these things. It, God's hand seems to always make it happen in the end, as all these Pruitts have been. That may be a final closing concert with as many of the people who hadn't seen each other since Andre's death five years ago. Dean Archer. Well, I think that's a perfect question to, to sort of close this out in that what happens now? It's sort of like with um, Baylor's aspirations be R1, Tier 1. It's not just getting there. That's part of the process, but then it's a new lifestyle. So as we have the physical collection, we continue to digitize. We continue to provide access to the world. So in, from my perspective, if I think about it, essentially we're creating access to the world for at least 3,500 tracks now that are outside of the copyright where we feel comfortable doing that, to the world. So part of our plan in, in working with even our communications team, how can we also do some outreach, uh, taking out um, ads and music librarianship uh, journals so that more people will actually link to the resource because it is a database, just like many of the other paid databases that we have for streaming music. But it's available for the world. And I'm at an institution whose strategic plan is Illuminate. And ever since arriving, I've thought of this whole project as a manifestation of Illuminate. Because we're helping to illuminate and let the rest of the world have free access and document the rest of the collection so that other researchers who need to dive in a little bit more can come here. And sort of that's, to me, what's behind it. And then that means hopefully we have some gospel artists who they're working on some new compositions. What better place than maybe to come and have access to the collection and to dive in and to play, well now, and to play along with it and really engage with it. So I just really see that there's a whole momentum here that continues on top of this work, and it is even fueled by our very mission. And even for, you know, it, uh, Bob talks about what, well, you know, what's my vision, and, and for me, the vision is actually rooted in Baylor. Um, I'm at a Christian university that's unapologetically Christian, and if I think about that in its holistic terms, I thank God for creating me and those who look like me, but I value even more Everyone is God's creation, and it's our job to really uplift and celebrate and honor and see God in the cultures that are around us. And to me, that's what drives sort of my direction in this. And what better place to do that and to be empowered to do that than here at Baylor? So see, that's really, we're, we're fulfilling our mission and fulfilling God's work. Thank you all for being here. Uh, just a little bit of refreshments. There are posters. Uh, we'll be around for a little bit if there's, um, are there any questions? But this place is open 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. If you want to reserve the booth, the website will change uh, within the next day or two so you can reserve the, uh, the booth so you know you can get in and play and listen. Um, but it's really meant for our students and our faculties to come here and our community. I'm really hoping our, our local churches will take advantage of this. And uh, so a student asked me, you know, so what, do you, what's even, what else do you want to see happen? I said, now that I have this site, what better way to have a, um, a prayer breakfast with local African-American pastors here in this spot? So, I mean, that, those are kinds of community things that I think that naturally comes out of it. So thank you. God bless you. 
Thank you for all of your work and thank you for all of our support.